So introductions, I'm Nick Price, I'm Deputy Director, Operations of the Government Legal Department. Um, I'm also the chair of the um, LGBT network within GLD um, and have done that job for probably two and a half years. Prior to that, I was the chair for MOD and GLD because I'm actually an MOD civil servant. Um, and prior to that, I was the chair for the MOD for two years. So I've sort of been actively LGBT networking for probably five and a half years. Um, my day job... Um, Director Operations, I've got about 80 staff. Um, we do all the IT, all the um, soft and hard FM for the whole of the department, which is about 2,500 people. Um, so I do everything from ensuring the building stays up, business resilience and safety, um, to making sure that there is food in the canteen. So it's a very broad role. So I'm Kate Scott Hughes. I work in the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, I am currently the outgoing vice chair of CISRA and uh, I've been doing that role for about four years and John gets to take over from me at the outcome of this particular stage of the process. Um, I've also been the chair of the CPS LGBT network for about 10 years. I stood down from that a year ago when I started my current job as workplace adjustments manager because that meant to move into the CPS diversity and inclusion team and I decided that being a chair of a network and part of the DNI team was possibly a potential conflict of interest. So um, I relinquished that responsibility. Um, so yeah, before doing the chair of the CPS role, I was secretary, vice chair, um, something called a driver right at the beginning. Not entirely sure what that was meant to be, but it generally meant catching lots of different things as they came in. Um, so I've been involved in leading networks since 2002 um, which yeah proves that I'm older than I look. <laughs> um, in my day job I'm a workplace adjustments manager which means that I'm responsible for making sure that adjustments under the Equality Act are made for every appropriate member of CPS staff which is certainly an interesting job because we don't just operate out of our own buildings we operate out of courts um, and there's all sorts of lovely intricate little details you get with courts because a lot of them are listed buildings so changing things in them is really easy. Um, so yeah it's a nice challenging role which involves talking to people all over the country at all levels and trying to persuade them to do things that they don't think they need to do but I know that they do need to do. Um, that's pretty much me. So. Um... I have to honestly admit that um, this bit I didn't really think that much about, um, just because I've just come back from holiday. Um, but I think the key uh, things that I wanted to focus on was ensure that actually um, CSRA had a budget in the same way that um, Agenda did, so it's not always cap in hand, um, and actually trying to um, beg, borrow and steal money off other people, so actually we are structured more effectively. Um, on that same point, I think it would be really important if we could try our utmost to join up with Agenda, because it seems ridiculous that now we actively have the T in our name, that they should um, be separate, because actually we would be stronger and more focused if we were together, and actually the resource sharing would make so much more sense. Um, my real idea and focus for the sort of the next two years is to up our game on both bi and trans, because I think all government networks are sadly lacking in all those things and certainly MOD and um, GLD do not do nearly as much as they should do um, and I think that's true of all of them um, and I wanted to really focus more on um, they're not connected but they sound like they are the faith and BAME so really I was interested in actually those silent minorities um, so moving away from um, the male gay you know, gay man who wants to go out and drink and actually focusing on those people who actually need a network to support them and help them. Um, but also provide, you know, the social activity as well. We've got a lot of skill across all the departments and we don't consolidate that skill effectively and share best practice and copy each other and work as a team. And that's what I really want to do. I think it's ridiculous that, you know, when I was MOD chair, we joined up with... Um, 
GLD purely because I was both chairs. Now we don't talk to each other at all because I'm not part of that organisation. Um, and there's so many things we can share and learn and copy from each of us all the time. I think we would be so much stronger and more effective if we did that. That's really what I'm in, into. And really, it's about empowerment. I think we need to get civil service to start doing um, the whole role modeling and civil service learning should be doing um, mentoring for LGBT. It shouldn't just be bog standard. It should be, you know, we shouldn't have to go to Stonewall every time we want to do these things. It should be part of the curriculum that, you know, diversity is taken properly seriously. So it's not just a lip service thing. Um, and that's the end of my page. So I wanted to give you a bit of background on myself initially. Um, I grew up in a family where compassion, integrity and fairness are, were fundamental to who we were. And I think the view that my parents had was if they managed to instill that in us, then we'd go out into the world and make it a better place, regardless of any other qualities that we had. And that that's probably what's brought me to doing all of the network stuff and to being here in front of you today. Um, I grew up as a bisexual person in a Christian family and coming from that background with a family with those values could have been really difficult because we lived in a little village in the middle of Hertfordshire where everybody knew everybody else's business and told everybody everybody else's business. <laughs> so. I understand what that isolation feels like that a lot of civil servants out there feel all the time. Um, I currently live in York, so I understand what it's like to be away from Whitehall, but because of the role that I've had in CISRA and in the CPS, I've been operating in that Whitehall bubble for quite a long time, so I know how to, how to do it, how to play the game, how to work with the right people and influence in the right way to get things done. Um, you'll probably have seen from the stuff that I've put out already that my priorities are actually quite similar to Nick's. Um, I want to work on that isolation that particularly bi and trans staff feel. Um, I want to get the network chairs working together more effectively and give them the support that we've not been able to give them over the last few years. There's been a lot of stuff that Ollie and I have delivered over the last six years that we've been working together. but supporting the networks in the way that we wanted to hasn't been possible and I think now is the time to really put a focus on that. Um, there's an awful lot of things that we can do to reduce the isolation felt by individuals around setting up cross-departmental events that happen out in the regions as well as in the centre, moving stuff away from London if we can do, using our own in-house experience to set up events rather than having to rely on external speakers all the time. We've got a huge amount of experience and resource within the civil service and we don't tap into it because the networks that we have don't reach out far enough and that's one of the main things that I'd want to focus on. Um, I also know that I've got the right contacts in the centre to be able to do that. I work quite closely with the civil service diversity and inclusion team in both the day job and the CISRA job at the moment. And I can press the right buttons to get the right resources in the right places. So essentially that's what I would bring, that networking and that understanding of regions and isolation and try and get a more cohesive civil service rainbow alliance working effectively for everyone. Probably, it's kind of two. Um, I initiated the role models publication that we did in the CPS, which then sparked the work on the civil service wide role models publication that CISRA did. Um, and I think that's, that's impacted so many different people in understanding that actually role models aren't just about being senior. They're not just about being at the top and being in the influential places in the centre. They're about living your life honestly, openly and being there for other people to see and to learn from and just being true to yourself. I think that that's probably the thing I'm proudest of and the thing that I think has made the most difference to civil servants, not necessarily the civil service, but to civil servants. I should have gone first. Um, <laughs> God, dear. Um, mine sounds really 
superficial, but actually I don't think it is. Um, so I think after, I don't know how many, t how many years we've had Pride, um, the last year that I was chair of the MOD LGBT, I managed to get the MOD to put the flag up. Um, and that was an astonishing achievement. Um, and at exactly the same time, I also managed to get the red arrows to fly over. So actually, that was me. Um, I know that both those are really superficial, but actually trying to get... Because um, the army had failed, the navy had failed, um, and the RAF said, no, we couldn't have the red arrows. And I had to go straight to the minister and say, this is ridiculous. You're championing LGBT in the armed forces, and you're saying that we can't do this. And it was submission after submission after submission. And eventually she stepped in and said this is ridiculous and we did it and for all the staff in MOD it was a huge thing um, it's not it wasn't a thing for the whole of the civil service I think the same as yours but actually for those people in the MOD who were able to see that actually for the first time we did it and it had set, and the other thing is having ever worked in the MOD or a big department you have to set a precedent so the minute it happened the first year it has continued they don't won't do the so the um, red arrows against it was too expensive, they're a bit mean. <laughs> but the flag thing has continued, and they now do the trans flag as well, so which is brilliant. But it was breaking down that barrier, and I think that was a huge sign to the department that actually things were changing. So I was really proud of that. I suppose, um, really, for most of it, is building on what I've done in the MOD already um, and what we're doing in GLD. Um, it's about opening some doors and, and engaging with them, So, um, but in a way that isn't threatening. So we've started, certainly in, like in GLD at the moment, we now invite people specifically saying that this, this event would be great if... Um, why people want to come to it or you know we are running trans events um, in the MOD we actually used to do targeted marketing to people who we thought would know people who'd know people so it's um, the trouble is part of the silent minority are people who are attached to networks but don't do anything and part of people who actually don't really know the networks exist and the problem I find with Civil Service Rainbow Alliance at the moment um, is the same with all the networks is if you don't know it's there you can't find it and it's something you really need to work on as we do with all our internal networks because people it's not signposted well enough you don't know it exists when you join the civil service you don't get a brochure that says oh by the way it's simple things like that that have made a huge difference and it's about increasing the presence of both the leadership but also the local groups to make sure that people know you're there because slowly and surely certainly where I am now we have started attracting uh, BAME um, and by people who are coming out and are happy to say that in the group now that really never happened in MOD we had some trans people who were coming out but it, you know that was for you know because we were offering trans support there were still no bi people open in MOD for instance because there's still that barrier people f feel that it's it's not a safe place to be and um, or certainly what it wasn't when I was when I last you know looked at the stats so it's about making it in making them feel empowered and engaged and also it's safe so the next thing we're doing is start we're starting running um, events that are purely for buys or BAME that no one else can come to so actually they can start developing their own sort of safe networks and then decide whether or not they want to join with the rest of us and that's what I would intend to do I think for me the issue is that isolation and that not having an identifiable group that is like them so I would probably start off by creating those groups initially online and looking at um, setting up events that are specifically aimed at certain parts of the demographic that we cover. Um, I'd probably also put out there some more literature around actually what it can be like. So use some of the role models, get some more role models in and get people talking about it to break down some of those barriers and see that there are more people out there that are like those individuals so that they've got someone to identify with. Um, and look at resourcing across the networks. So at the moment, when we run events, quite often we'll have one specific network will push it and some of the others won't. Um, what I'd like to do is to give the network chairs and the network leaders more support so that they do feel able to 
do some cross networking events and get a greater mass initially but in a safe space that people feel like they can go along and participate in it but I think for me a, a lot of the key is being very upfront online about how actually this is important to us and raising the profile there first so that there's more trust in CISRA initially from those people and then they're more likely to come along and getting people to bring their friends the hardest thing in the world is to walk into an event like that on your own it's it can be so daunting it doesn't matter whether you're an extrovert or not it can be really daunting as somebody who perhaps is bi but everybody perceives as being straight or gay because of assumptions that are made um, or somebody who is trans but passes quite happily walking into that room can be really difficult if you do it with somebody else it's a lot easier so it'll be about making those little connections initially first as well and one of the ways that I want to do that is to start working more closely with agenda so that the local networks that we have out in the regions are a lot stronger and there is more kind of cross networking going on Well, the London drinks are proving very successful, um, so I would definitely continue those. Um, I think probably I would try to replicate them in some of the regions, but not necessarily all. Um, but I would also probably do some market research, for want of a better phrase, <laughs> to identify actually what do people in different areas want? You know, do, do people in Greater Manchester want drinks, or would they rather have um, a walking group that goes out and walks on the moors on a Saturday you know I don't know because I've not asked them so that would probably be my initial task would be to go out and find out actually what do people in the regions want because we know what works in London and that is drinks after work because everybody comes into the centre on a day and they can do something easily on the way home whereas places like York, Newcastle, Manchester Bristol it's a much smaller location and there is an awful lot more that you can do that's more easily accessible so probably I would look into seeing actually what works for that area what works for that region what works for those people and then support the regional representatives in putting that into place so it's all a bit samey, is it? So I'm about to say the same thing, really. So we're, we're sort of interchangeable. We were talking about that beforehand, actually, that we're sort of, you know, you can either have a boy version or a girl version of the same thing, really. Um, I, certainly, I absolutely agree with Kate. The London drinks really works um, enormously well. Um, and MOD do Bristol drinks for the same reason, because there's a hub and uh, that works very well. Um, bizarrely, you know, as a network in GLD, we don't do drinking. We tend to do things so we've been to art galleries we've been to um talks those sort of things and that works much better because people on the whole seem to don't not want to go out with their colleagues in the evening necessarily but will go out we did one on a sunday for instance so i think it's absolutely what you said it's what is it the the congregation want and how do we offer it and i think it there isn't a one size fits all um but building on something that kate said previously the other thing is to to in I suppose enhance the things that other networks are doing. So, you know, if I'm doing a, an event to the VNA as a, a single organisation, why isn't it that we're all going? Um, you know, open, you know, we we sent nine people. We had thirty up to thirty places. You know, why did we not just invite everybody? And it was, you know, I didn't, sort of didn't think about it. And it's about joining up more effectively as an LGBT community and using, I suppose, CSRA as the vehicle to actually enable that networking and socialising. The other thing is I would do is more networking events. Something that um, happens a lot commercially is they have these events where you actually do almost career and networking stuff and we don't really do any of that. You know, we don't really have conversations about, you know, what opportunities are there in your department, those sort of events and, you know. And uh, I'd certainly focus more on mentoring stuff. Um, that's probably another question. <laughs> We would. I, I think the one thing that we don't do terribly well, so something we CISRA doesn't do terribly well, um, is the follow up. So we all trundled off and did the um, the Stonewall meetings, and then the follow up to that was just not 
effective, certainly to the ones I've been to, um, because there isn't the momentum. So actually you need to get people into a room, you need to workshop it, and you actually need to start pairing people up. So it's about buddying almost. And say, you know, um, if it do something way better than MOD or vice versa and actually get them together. Um, and actually there's a bit of an enforcement there that actually once you do sit together, you write it up and actually then you share it. So you share it online. So actually we are way better at networking or mentoring. How is it you're better? Well, actually produce a pack that could be used um, and then actually go and talk to them. So it's about actually using the chairs and the resources that we have within all of the groups um, as a pool of resource. So that's what I would do. I think I would probably start getting the network leaders round the table a little bit more than we have done more recently. Um, over the last few years, we've kind of relied on a large and ever-changing population of volunteers. And that's probably not assisted the networks because a lot of those have been within the networks team. So we've built up relationships and then the individual that's built the relationship is gone. So I think probably what I would do is pull it back into the sort of into the central control again and start getting people around the table and talking and kind of almost recreating like a heads of diversity style meeting where actually we do sort of talk about what we're doing and what what each individual network strengths and weaknesses are and start really working together and identifying where there's pockets of good practice and where there can be some buddying to help to raise standards and actually where where is one network doing something really really well that you know we can just open up to everybody So again, improving the ethnic diversity of CISRA probably comes down to that visibility thing of seeing other people like me. Um, one of the things I'd like to do would be to rejuvenate the role models style of profile, um, which we're doing a little bit through the impact index, but I'd quite like to take that a step further and really kind of roll it out and have a vast portfolio of people who are prepared to just tell their story on the CISRA website um, and be featured on Twitter and talk about who they are and where they come from and what their background is because it's not just about ethnicity it's also about social mobility it's about disability there's a vast range of different backgrounds that we all come from and I think trying to put people into boxes isn't necessarily helpful but just showcasing people for who they are and what they bring to CISRA and to the wider civil service is probably the best way of attracting other people and broadening out that diversity. It is dull, isn't it? I'm gonna, it's the same thing. I'm really sorry. It's, <laughs> because it's sort of, there's, there's only one really logical answer. Um, but I, I think building on what Kate said, and I absolutely agree with what she said. So the, the fact that we do not have enough... Um, BAME um, or disabled um, or um, those with um, social mobility background issues as it were coming out and saying actually we're part of a network is a, is a real issue and it's something I'm doing at work at the moment um, for my own department um, because you just realise that there are people out there but for whatever reason they just don't want to engage um, and I think it's two prong. I think absolutely what Kate said makes perfect sense but there is a need I think um, certainly within um, certain um, Asian ethnic backgrounds to actually offer more closed groups so actually they feel safe to actually be themselves even if it's only for a short time um, and it may be you know off premise in a different building they're not even known in but um, you know I've tried to get um, LGBT um, Muslims to come to my event who I know exist in my organisation and they will not come because they worry that people who don't understand the sensibilities um, about them being gay will mention something to someone who knows someone who knows someone and it will get back to their families or friends or whatever and that is particularly true in our department because everyone seems to know each other because <laughs> law schools everyone knows everyone um, so that must be the same elsewhere and I think there's there's a there's a need for safe space which I think is something you said anyway but um, it's about 
having role models, absolutely, and it's about providing safe space. Um, the other thing I think is important is um, not branding people. I think, um, yes, CISRA is you know, the Rainbow Alliance, but people don't have to declare. You know, we need to be a bit more fluid about membership. And if people don't want to say they're L G B or T and actually want to wear an Allies badge or whatever, and, and that's where they're comfortable, and they, may, and they may be comfortable like that for a number of years, then we should just let them do it. Um, and certainly that's how we've got around it a bit in my own network at the moment, because we've got people who I know are LGBT, but they attend as an ally, and we don't ask because it's actually not our business. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. For me, labels aren't particularly useful in that no. space, and I think we maybe need to move away from them a lot more than we currently do to just allow people to be themselves. I mean, you know, I'm first and foremost, I'm Kate. It doesn't matter what other labels I've got. I'm Kate, and you see what I choose to let you see of me. And everybody else should get th that same opportunity. And it should be their choice. It right. shouldn't be forced on them. I think for me, I would probably do a bit of an offensive on the resourcing issue of the various networks and the disparity. Um, CISRA has done a massive amount in the last few years based on entirely on voluntary contribution. Um, either the, the contribution of departments who are generous enough to give some of their staff members time or individuals giving up their own time or a combination of the two in a few cases. Um, and the civil service is quite happy to ride off the back of that and I think it's about time that that changed and that there was a more robust structure in place that actually looked at giving resources that we can then manage rather than it having to be about going and begging, borrowing and stealing, as Nick said earlier, for every conference that we want to run, every event that we want to run. Um, and more importantly, about getting, giving that expertise. Some departments are quite happy to let their staff do this kind of work, and some aren't. And there needs to be more parity around that and more of a steer from the centre around actually no this this is good business sense for the civil service to do this and we are doing it because it's the right thing to do and the people that need to be doing it are the people that are out there at the front line doing the roles in the civil service it's not always about a central team doing it and that's where CISRA can really impact and that's where Sue could impact by making that structure happen and be in place I think. And I think building on that, it's the um, it's the parity between CISRA and Agenda. Why Agenda have um, paid staff um, and a budget, and CSRA does not, which is just ridiculous, um, given um, the work that CISRA has been doing. You know, as you say, absolutely voluntarily. You know, and um, that seems utterly mad um, that there isn't a proper budget and a proper structure in place. Um, but also, she needs to be way more vocal. Um, the interesting thing is I had to tell my senior champion that that what Sue Owen's role was. Um, and I actually told my permanent secretary that was her role. So, yes, she does the job, but she doesn't bring it up at Wednesday meetings as often as she should. And it's one of those things I think it has to happen every week. If you, you know, you don't have to be shouting from the rooftops, but actually... She is there for all of us on a weekly basis. Why is she not doing it at Wednesday Colleagues? That's what I would want her to do, because the only way um, you actually get your voice heard is by making it loud enough for people to listen to it. Role modelling as an ally. Indeed, absolutely. I think in, so this is my go, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I think um, I think it's actually about it being part of um, their role, so they actually get marked on it. So you know, on SES, I have a diversity you know role within my job description because we all have to have a corporate contribution, which is actually very fortunate for me. So actually, what I do in uh, GLD, you know, is part of my conditioned hours to an extent. Um, and actually is, made, is taking it to that level. It's like, if we're all meant to be making a corporate contribution, we'll get marked against it. So, you know, they should be held to account for what they're doing. Um, and actually, 
be pushing it through. So, you know, we should provide training. I think, you know, they should be got into a room and trained and told what is expected of them. And it's not actually just for LGBT, it's probably for every single um, diversity um, champion needs to be actually told this is what is expected of you and get out and do it, opposed to it being something, you know, if it's gender, you give it to the, a lady, if it's LGBT, you find another lady because the men don't want to do it, um, you know, and it's all that ridiculousness if it's disabled, you have to find the one disabled person who doesn't want to do it to do it. It's not about that, it's about finding someone who actually can push it forward and get on with it. Um, and they actually, in all honesty, the best um, champions tend to be the ones that don't identify to the group because they're the ones that tend to be more curious and engaged because actually they want to learn themselves. Um, I think actually having an LGBT champion who is LGBT, they can sometimes be a bit complacent and laissez-faire about it, to be quite honest. If you can get someone that senior to actually admit to being LGBT anyway in the first place, which is actually another issue, isn't it? Um, but I think it's, it's about actually, if they were given proper roles, and bizarrely they are sort of, because they come out of Manzoni's office as, you know, proper roles, but actually are held to account, then actually they might do something useful with it. You know, I think it's shameful that, you know, they're not all marching every year. You know, they, you get two of them marching, for instance. It's like, you know, put their money where their mouth is, or get a box C. I think as well as that, it's... It's about getting the network chairs into a position where they feel confident to appropriately challenge the champions. And I think in some departments there can be quite a high turnover of network lead, partly because of the high turnover of staff in those departments, or all of a sudden that bit of responsibility within that department moves to another and the network lead moves with it and can no longer lead that network. Um, so you get people sort of suddenly thrust into the limelight that don't necessarily have the, sort of the tools in their toolbox to be able to have those conversations with somebody that is that senior. So I think there would be a lot of merit in doing workshops and buddying up and really actually training the network leads themselves in how to be a critical friend to the organisation and how to navigate that sometimes choppy water of having the difficult conversation, but also having the confidence of the champion that you're not being challenging in order to upset them or to expose them. You're being challenging in order to protect them so that they've had a chance to think about the issue that's potentially going to blow up before it blows up and put something in place that will work to mitigate the risks. I think quite often there is a distrust between the two where actually it could be a really strong reverse mentoring relationship that works really, really well. So I think there is something about upskilling some of the network leads by using the skills of the other network leads to really get them used to having those conversations and giving them a safe space to practice having those conversations. I think engaging outside the civil service as a alliance of networks would probably benefit the civil service and CISRA hugely. Um, we know, for example, that we've got various issues with things like completing the workplace equality index that Stonewall run, and some of that is down to Stonewall not necessarily understanding how we are structured, and some of that is down to us not necessarily understanding what Stonewall are asking for. Um, that conversation isn't happening in the way that it could be from the central diversity and inclusion team because of other pressures that they've got on um, and actually CISRA going and asking those questions we're in a much better place having completed the workplace equality index ourselves as network leads to ask the right questions and identify what the issues are and identify where actually Stonewall's expectations are maybe too high because of legislation that's in place that prevents us from doing certain things. Um, or where we just can't do it because of the way that the civil service is structured. So I think there is a massive benefit in it. And there's also a benefit in going wider than Stonewall and looking at things like age concern. I mean, every department has five volunteer days that each individual is entitled to take. And, you know, why not? start to build up those networks and relationships by using those for 
to volunteer for LGBT organisations? Why not go and work with Gallup around hate crime if you've got a background in working in sort of criminal justice to help them to understand the criminal justice system a bit better? We've all got lots of expertise that we could put in place to really help support the community that's out there via those different charities and groups. So I think there's a massive potential value in it. And again, that builds up those local networks. And again, it builds up the stuff out in the regions of people feeling as though they're contributing without having to come to the drinks in London on a Thursday night on the first week of the month. Interesting, on, the, on my bit of paper it says about Stonewall, um, because I was thinking um, that actually, logically, we should try and do a single WI for the civil service in some bizarre way, which would be a nightmare. But, um, <laughs> but actually, for the same reason you say, because um, organisations... So one, one thing is those sort of organisations, how we actually join up effectively so we're not spending vast amounts of money and actually getting very little out of it, because that's what we do at the moment, because we all pay for something and get very little back. Um, and as you say, they don't understand what we're doing. But I think there are opportunities certainly within the third sector, but also um, within the skill zones that we all work in. So um, joining up with the Bar Council, joining up with teachers' unions. And things. So actually, you know, we actually encourage people to have proper dialogue. So actually, you know, it helps career management, it helps, helps diversity within the organisation, it helps our recruitment. That would be really helpful because at the moment we do that really badly. Um, so actually not just joining up with charities or LGBT groups, but actually joining up with people who can A, advance our work generally as a civil service, but actually maybe encourage people into the civil service because they see that we are actually a diverse and inclusive employer who actually offers a good opportunity. So I think that would be really useful to do because it's something you can do relatively easily and it's about once the door's open you can do it really well. It's getting that door open in the first place and then the floodgates open. But the charity work I think is a brilliant idea. I think it's something we are too insular in, you know, and you know, why are we not all helping in homeless kitchens or whatever? Because we should be doing something and it's not all about us. Um, and actually it really helps people who are not LGBT realise that LGBT people are nice people who just don't care about themselves, they care about the community and individuals and want to give something back. And actually I think that's really a positive thing. Um, so you've all heard what I would like to do, you've quizzed me about it. I don't really have much more to add other than um, I think that I know what we need to do, I think I know how we can do it. Um, i just like the opportunity to do it. I'm sort of the same. I, 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 you've, you've heard um, what I want to say and you've read about me previously. Um, I think the only advantage I have over Kate, and I think she has way more advantages over me, is I am in central London and I can appear in central London at a moment's notice if someone calls me to a meeting, whereas it's a real trauma for you. But actually, she has way more experience than I do in the policy stuff. I think the advantage that I, maybe I have is that at least I have climbed up the greasy pole and have seen your civil servant, so I can get into doors slightly more easily so on occasion. Um, but the reason I signed up to do this is because Actually, I want to make a difference, and actually, at departmental level, you can only go so far. And I think it is really important that we push as a civil service for equality and more effective uh, LGBT networks, and that's why I want to do it.